Folks, um, you'll recognize this device. We uh, just uh, got this at all the bases. Allows for end tidal CO2 monitoring in the non-intubated patient. It also allows for O2 insufflation. And there's a question that has come up around how much O2 flow we can get through this. So I'm just gonna show you up close this device. And the O2 actually comes through these tiny little perforations here. That's where the O2 comes. And then the CO2 is sampled here and here. Uh, so let's see how much flow we can get out of here. Uh, we've got our trusty um, blue box here. And I'm gonna turn it up to roughly 15. And this is, it's hard to get to fit all of these inside our, our opening here, but we'll get a sense. So we'll put that in and you'll see it's a little bit variable, but we're getting about six. Um, and I think that's probably not that accurate because I was able to get it quite a bit higher earlier. So let's just, let's just, I want you to listen to that and I can, I can feel that flow on my hand and then just listen to the, the sound change when I crank the flow. So I'm going up well beyond the 15 liters here. And I mean, that is just way more flow. And we'll try and see if we can get it measured here. Yeah, so you can see the flow is really high. So the reason this, the reason this question came up is because the manufacturer recommends um, less than five liters per minute. So I think that the problem with flows greater than five liters per minute, at least from the manufacturers, that it probably washes out the CO2 and your CO2 reading will be inaccurate. This probably isn't very important if you're pre-oxygenating the patient. And it looks like the flow rates through this are plenty to pre-oxygenate the patient if you're, you know, if you're preparing for an intubation. So um, there you go. Uh, yeah, lots of flow through these. Thanks everybody. Folks, I'm on uh, room air now. I have no flow going through this same uh, device. And again, just remind you, we're talking about this device right here, the Smart Capno Line Plus O2 for uh, entitled CO2 monitoring in the non-intubated patient. So I'm just gonna try and demonstrate what flow does to our ability to monitor CO2. So so right now I'm talking, so my respiratory rate's a little bit higher, and but you'll see the entitled CO2 is 32, which is pretty normal. And we've been playing with this for a little while and it stays in that range. So let's see what flow does on the wall to that reading. So we're gonna go up to, to four initially. So four liters per minute. So fairly steady, maybe dropped a little bit there. Let's go up to the manufacturer's limit, which they say is five liters per minute. So you can see it drops, I'm not hyperventilating. I think what's happening is as we go up on the flow rates, the CO2 gets washed out a little, so your CO2 reading becomes a little more inaccurate. Let's just go up higher. We'll go up to, to 10. So you can see it, it drops quite a bit and again, I, I don't think I've changed my um, ventilation that much to, to explain that amount of drop to 21 millimeters of mercury there. So, so the five liter per minute recommendation uh, from the manufacturer, which you'll see right there, is, um, is, you know, we've already demonstrated that the device is capable of delivering far more than five liters per minute. 
basically what you put in at the wall is what you're going to deliver from an auction point of view. But once you get, once you start to get into the higher flow rates and the manufacturer says above five, it's not like five is going to be a magic number. But uh, once you get into those higher flow rates, you're going to have wash out of your of your CO2, and so your CO2 reading, um, your CO2 reading will be falsely uh, falsely low uh, as you get into higher O2 flow rates. That may or may not be important uh, if you're using this as a pre-oxygenation device, for example. It's probably not that important, but just be aware that that's where that five liters per minute uh, recommendation comes from. The higher you go with your O2 flow rates, the more washout you're going to get of your end tidal CO2 and you'll get a falsely, draw, uh, falsely low reading for your end tidal CO2. Okay, thanks everybody. Hi folks, we are just going to go back and uh, review this PowerPoint that you received in June 2020's Moodle. Um, just to clarify some things around this new end tidal CO2 sensor. So let's just review some of the features again quickly. Remember the CO2 is sampled from this oral scoop and it's also sampled from the two nares here. O2 is delivered from these perforations it, that, that exist along here, sort of at ground level. That's where the O2 is delivered. You'll recall that uh, we're going to use it for um, monitoring respiratory and hemodynamic status on conscious non-intubated patients and to enable CO2 bracketing. We recommended not using it for pre-oxygenation. This was based on the manufacturer's recommendation of a max O2 delivery of 5 liters per minute of oxygen. And in many of our patients this is not a high enough flow rate for pre-oxygenation. And so we, we showed this slide. Now recall uh, in the video I just that you just watched that the flow rates through those perforations uh, are much higher than five liters. And basically what you put in it, put in at the wall, you will be getting out of those perforations. So we've softened our stance on this a little bit. If you arrive on scene and the patient has one of these devices in place already and there is no issue with oxygenation, then we think you can leave them on and use this as part of your pre-oxygenation along with your non-rebreather and BVM as required. If you are having issues with oxygenation, we think you should probably swap out to a standard nasal cannula. And the reason for this is the location of the oxygen outflow. When it's through a nasal cannula, it's through the wider bores that are sitting right in the nose itself and delivered higher up in the nares. Through the end tidal CO2 sensing device, this O2, I'll just switch back to this slide, is again delivered through ground level here, so to speak. And some of this flow is not actually going to get into the nares. It's probably going to miss the nares. And it's probably not as efficient. There's no literature to guide us here, but we just think it makes sense that if oxygenation is an issue, that we switch back to a standard nasal cannula so that the O2 will be delivered through the nares directly into the nose. So that's it. Uh, just I wanted to clarify that. Again, if oxygenation is not an issue, there is the patient satting 100%, there's no problem with oxygenation and they've got one of these devices in place, we think you can leave them on from a pre-oxygenation point of view and certainly you can turn the flow rates through them higher than five liters as previously demonstrated. Just know that your end tidal CO2 reading becomes less accurate the higher the flow rate of oxygen. Thanks everybody, take care.